Boxer, and uh, you were Michael's uh, musical director for so long, for several decades, mm -hmm. um, and you went on so many concerts with him. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you can still count them. <laughs> Hundreds. <laughs> Hundreds. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. So, um, what would you say? How do you remember Michael as a musician? How would you describe um, that? I did. Uh, I did the touring. Uh, Every live gig he did from 1989 until the time he died. So if he was on stage uh, doing a concert, I was I was there with him. Um, I also did seven album projects. So I did um, Dangerous, History, Blood on the Dance Floor, Invincible, The Box Set, The Ultimate Collection, and then I wrote Hollywood Tonight with him, which is the first song on the first album released after he died. So seven projects, album projects. So I saw him as a musician in the studio we, we we wrote tons of stuff together he i was the his collaborator for all those years and that means that we would write songs from scratch right so um then i was on tour with him too so i did both mm -hmm. things which is pretty unique so how did i see him as an artist and a, a musician he's a workaholic he's a perfectionist and he made it, it very enjoyable to work with in the studio. We had a blast and it it got to the point where it, the relationship was in, just incredibly strong. We're exactly the same age, we're three months apart. When I first went in, into Westlake in 1989 after Billy Betrell called me on a project that uh, Michael was working on, which is the beginning of Dangerous, we hit it off instantly. And so I kept getting called back and you know, so as far as doing work for him in the studio, you have to perform for him. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to perform, but as long as you perform for him, which means do a good job for him, and he likes you, you'll keep getting called back. And so I did a really good job for him. He loved what I did, and the personalities were completely in sync. As far as on the road, he um, most of the time did great shows. Um, at the end of Dangerous, when we were in Mexico City, when... He went to the Betty Ford Clinic, right? Um, there was a couple shows that weren't great, right? But still mm -hmm. the audience, he dances so well that the audience really didn't notice it probably, and but we noticed it, right? So um, he's a little sluggish. Um, on the last show we did in Mexico City, so it was time for him to get help. And then um, like on the history tour, all the performances were amazing, you know? And so he's, uh, he's a perfectionist there, so basically, as far as the band goes, I was the musical director, so as long as I had the band sounding great, he he was totally happy. I had the band sounding great. I studied mm -hmm. the show tapes each night. Just like when I was in Stevie Wonder's band, even though I was just a keyboard player in Stevie Wonder's band, I taped the shows each night with a DAT recorder on my keyboard. I'd study the show and make improvements, right? So with Michael... I did the same thing, but this time I didn't have to put a tape recorder on my keyboard because as a musical director, I can just get the tapes from Trip Kayla in front of house doing our, our mixing. So, but I did what I always did. I took the tapes home to the hotel. So I didn't go down to the bar. I went up to my hotel room, listened to the whole show, wrote out notes for Michael and then put them under his door. And so the next morning he would get them. And um, what I also did is kept fine tuning the way the band sounded. So in other words, if David Williams, our guitar player, rhythm guitar player, in starting something, was playing sloppily, I would just say, David, do you want to see how you sounded last night? And I'd mm -hmm. play him his solo, and he, he, he goes, oh my God, that's terrible. <laughs> and that was fixed. Never mm -hmm. do that again. And the same thing, with any of the players that I needed to change parts in, the first thing I would do is play them what they're sounding like. And then after they heard what they're sounding like, say, you know, we need to do it more like the record or we need to do it this way or that. And, and at any rate, Michael was loving the improvements I was doing, was loving how the band sounded. So how does Michael know how the band sounds? Because Michael is not going to sit there and listen to a band tape each night, but Michael is going to watch the dancing. Mm -hmm. He is going to watch how the dancers performed. And the music of that performance is striped onto the dancing, right? 
Imagine having dancing with no music. Of course, you wouldn't do that. So he heard the music that night. You know, whatever he's looking at the dancers, right? If it's a, for a given show, that's the band performance that night. And he knew exactly how the band was sounding. Mm -hmm. And he loved it. And so he loved what I was doing. And so when the boss loves you, everyone loves you. So I had great relationships with the band members. Mm -hmm. met with each and every one of them. And it was wonderful. So again, you have to perform for them. But it got to the point where I could do this stuff in my sleep. I just instinctively knew how to give him exactly what he wanted. The band, you know, on the on the history tour, and I was, I the first leg of the Dangerous tour, I was just a, the other keyboard player. Then I did the Super Bowl music for him, for Super Bowl 27, and he loved it. And then I became the musical director, right? And then I needed another keyboard player. So I brought in Isaiah Sanders from Stevie Wonder's band, who I played oh. with in Stevie Wonder's band for six years. And now I'm, the musical director and so i'm doing all the arrangements for the band and it's just working beautifully so um we finish out the dangerous tour and then we do the history album and now we're touring for the history and you know it's a new songs new show and stuff like that but um the history tour the, the bands never sounded better so it, it was just wonderful as far as you you're back to your question how was michael as a musician as a performer to work with you know when we were on tour he didn't hang out with the band, right? The only time the band saw him was when we did the prayer circle before the show. With me, it was different. I had what's called a HRS system, a hotel room system, meaning they brought gear to my room for each country that we played in so that I could write and I would write with Michael. You know, so sometimes I'd be traveling with Michael on his plane. Other times I'd be traveling on the band's plane, mm -hmm. right? So the band had their own plane. Um, the crew had their own plane. Michael had his own plane. And then we, we had two Antonovs for the equipment. We had five airliners. <laughs> so um, he's very solitary on the road. He doesn't party. He doesn't do anything like that. And um, when I was working with him on the road in songs, it was just glorious. It was wonderful. Just like it was when we were, you know, at the ranch working on songs or in New York at the hip track, we were, whatever it was, mm -hmm. it was just wonderful. So um, he, he's, he's just very, I don't want to say demanding, but as long as you perform for him, you have to perform for him. Meaning if you're writing with him, you have to be able to play everything, arrange everything and, do, you know, and, and it worked. It's just great. That's why he, I did this for 20 years with him. That's great to hear today. Yeah. yeah. And um, if you look at him in retrospect as a human being, not just the artist, not just like your boss, mm. but the human being that he was, how would you describe him? Well, it was interesting because he was like my, he's the best friend I've ever had. And like anybody can say that, but people who actually have researched this know that. Nobody spent more time with him. And um, how was he as a human being? Like all of us, he's flawed, right? He's not perfect. And he is edgy and has a dark side and um, can also be very sweet and nice. And um, I think you got, I don't know if you saw what we played today of us in the studio together. You saw how much respect everyone got. So you saw me and Michael Prince, Michael Jackson and Bruce Swedeen, right? You saw the team that we you always talk about. You saw the interaction and it, there was total respect. It's like, and that's how it was. So you, you know, that's an hour and a half video thing that we shot and we played different segments of it, but that's how every session went, you know? So it was, it was just a wonderful relationship, you know, um, just, just incredible to that, you know, it's like, it's kind of like that, that magic will never happen again. I'll never work with any other artist ever that I'm that tight with as a friend and that musically syncopatic with or whatever it is mm -hmm. where they the music we just yell and the friendship is just through the roof so. and how would you describe him his personality um kind of if you try to get like let's say somebody's starstruck and they want to get to know him be his friend you'll never do it in a million years but if you just don't care and i'm not starstruck ever 
I think it's just ridiculous, right? I, I like nice people. That's what I really like. I don't care if you're a star or not. And um, so since I was able to do his music for him and didn't really care about getting close to him or hanging out with him, it just happens to get close to him and hang out with him. You know what I'm saying? So, so authenticity was very important to him, right? Yeah, it's like, let's say in a whole different scenario, you know, a guy likes a girl and he starts chasing her. She's going to run. You know, who wants that? But let's say the guy's not doing that, right? And they become friends and there's no pressure and she, she might start liking him. And so what I'm saying is that for Michael, it is a business relationship and a business relationship accompanied by an unbelievably good friendship. So I was with him constantly. I was like, I'd be at the, I've been at, stayed at the ranch for over a thousand days. You know, so like when we weren't on tour, we're in L.A., right? And I go up to the ranch all the time. And we had an HRS system, hotel room system set up in his dance studio. And we'd record there, right? And we put a microphone in the bathroom. And Bruce Swedeen showed me how to do the vocal chain. It's through a 1073 knee module and 1176 compressor and using that 149 mic, and right? And so the vocal chain that I would record him on was exactly what Bruce wanted and specified. And that way, when it went to the record, it was already recorded correctly. And then Bruce would, would take it and put it through the board and do other things to it. But um, Bruce sh showed me exactly how it needed to be done. And so that's that's what I did. And um, a lot of times it was just me and Michael. Sometimes Michael Prince would be up there, you know, helping with the recordings and stuff like that. Uh, but a, a lot of times, it, um, you know, it, it'd just be me. And when I was up at the ranch, you know, like... I had the run of the place. Like, um, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, so I rode dirt bikes. That's what you do in Phoenix. <laughs> so I had a nice dirt bike, and I'd bring it up to the ranch and ride it around the pool and ride it all just <laughs> all over the place. And there was nobody at the ranch, right? Michael doesn't really entertain very much. So um, I'd have my Mercedes up there, and sometimes he'd drive the Mercedes, and I'd drive his golf cart, which is like <laughs> he has these golf carts where... There, Michael gets cold really easily, so he has a golf cart with this big heater in it, and then mm -hmm. he has this huge sound system in it. So the thing is so bogged down electrically, it's very slow. Mm -hmm. So I drive that sometimes, <laughs> and he drives the Mercedes around. You know, so we traded cars, and then um, we, um, you know, like when you're up there, you can do whatever you want. So like, there's a amusement park, which is, I don't really care about that, but. There's the zoo, and then there's the game room. So you walk in the game room, flip one switch, and 50 video games come on. You can play them all. And then you go watch a movie. So <laughs> you go to the, where the dance theater, where, where, where the dance studio is. There's no recording studio, but where the dance studio is, that's where the movie theater is too, right? And so you walk into the movie theater. First, you walk in, and there's all this candy, like you'd see at a, hmm. at a regular movie theater. And there's ice cream and popcorn, but there's no one behind the counter. So you just go and grab as much crap <laughs> as you want. And then you go in the movie theater, and there's nobody in there, except it's a huge screen. And then the back wall has two bedrooms built into the wall. It's just unbelievable. And so you can sit in the captain's chairs, which are really plus chairs, and there's a center console where you can control the movie thing, you know. And then if you want to chill, <laughs> you go into the wall, you go through a door and now you're in a bedroom in a cinema with glass in front of you watching a movie of your choice on a big screen all by yourself, mm -hmm. you know? So it was, it was so much fun up there. So it yeah. sounds like you did the very, very serious work together. And you also had this, in contrast, this very free and relaxed he let me do time anything. together. Yeah. He just let me do anything. It's like, if I wanted to go back to LA because I was tired of being up there, he'd say, go and you know, he goes, we, we can work over the phone or whatever, but, um, so he was he, very generous, also. very generous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he, he was very generous. It was, is an unbelievably good relationship. And we, we laughed constantly. And like when we were doing music, there was never a discussion about, well, let's do an up-tempo song or let's do a song in this style. That's never, ever a discussion about anything. It's, we just go in there and we start whatever came out would come out, you know? And, and you made so many songs together. Yeah. And of all of those, if you were only able to pick a few, which ones would you I'll tell you, you the pick? ones that I love, uh, Course Stranger in Moscow, mm -hmm. Beautiful Girl, 
in the back, the way you love me. Um, Days of Gloucestershire, which is unreleased. Um, Will you be there? Um, I mean, there's a ton of stuff. There's I did 50 songs from scratch with them. Mm -hmm. You know what? What makes these um, stand out to you? Because they're just good songs. Just killer <laughs> yeah, songs. True. All right. Yeah, they're killer. They're, they're songs that I did with them that I really don't like. Like I, and the critics agree with me. Like I did the arrangement for the Lost Children. I didn't write it. That was him, but I had to still do the music for it. And it's just the song just is terrible. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. who cares about lost children? I don't. I mean, I don't even know what that means. You know, I happen to like it. But it's, I like the yeah, melody. Thanks it's, for still doing it. Yeah, it's then, simple, but I like it. Speechless, yeah. speechless oh. is it's not as bad, but it's it's not my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. And I did that over the phone with him uh, one night. That was the quickest song I've ever done with him. He called me at 4.30 in the morning, and by 6.30 in the morning, the song was done. Wow. The complete okay. demo was done, and we did it over the phone. Oh. Yeah. So, um, you know, then we still had to do vocals and stuff like that. But um, um, the best year was 2004 for songwriting. It was In the Back, Beautiful Girl, The Way You Love Me, um, Days of Gloucestershire, Adore You. It was like... After working with him for so long, it had been 15 years at that point, not only wasn't it getting stale, we were doing the best stuff that we've ever done. Mm -hmm. You know, and that that's amazing. Because a lot of times you work with an artist and everyone can relate to this who's a musician. They work with somebody and it works fine for the first couple of songs. And then one day you go in there and you try to write and you, nothing comes out. And mm -hmm. you go, well... That never, ever, ever once happened with us, ever. And I have no idea how that's possible. And Amazing. it never did. And the proof is, is I got 50 songs to show for it. You know, and you can't, you can't put together that many songs if, if you have roadblocks, right? There's not enough time. You know, that's, that's four albums of material. Mm -hmm. So um, it was just a very strange synergy, how it worked. It, 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 it it just worked. That that's why. That's why I, I was around for twenty years with him. You know, so yeah, you can you can work with anyone he wants. Yeah. Is there one specific memory that you would like to share with our fan community? I mean, there's not one. I I would say. The life I had with him. I mean. It, it's just it's. It's it, it was just the most incredible experience I I could ever have and it's like when i'm when i was watching that stuff today of us in the studio and stuff it's like heartbreaking that that that's not there anymore heartbreak bruce is gone michael's gone it's it's heartbreaking you know that was 19 years ago in 2003 mm -hmm. when that was taken and it was just what a it's it's kind of like if you're married to somebody and you have a great marriage and then the girl dies or something, and then you, you try to move on, you move on maybe, and and then you go back and look at movies of what you had, and it's like, it's just heartbreaking. You know, that I was so tight with Bruce, right? I'd punch him, I'd massage his shoulders, I we, we had so much fun. And and Bruce is, um, Bruce is very serious, very demanding. So you don't mess with Bruce when he, you don't mess with, mm -hmm. it's, in other words, like but let's, why would you, right? <laughs> well, no. Here, here's how it works. Let's say that Michael's upset with you. Michael's not going to do anything. He'll sick Bruce on you. <laughs> you know, and you don't you don't want that. You know, if Michael. Michael's trippy. If he, he'll be unhappy sometimes, and I've watched how he deals with people when he's unhappy, and he doesn't do it himself. He'll have other people do it. You know, that's what I'm saying. There, there is a dark side to him. But you know, as long as you, I didn't have to deal with Star Star because he loved me, right? We we got along incredibly well. And, but, uh, you know, I've, I've seen him be mad at other people. He would vent to me sometimes. Like, remember with Tommy Mottola? Mm -hmm. In public, he was saying he was the mm -hmm. devil. That's the head of Sony. I mean, really, you know, so when he was mad, he would, he, he'd get mad. I'd, I'd see him throw the phone down sometimes. I'd, I'd see him cry sometimes. Um, so, you know, but he was also an incredibly strong individual, stronger than anyone I've ever seen in this sense. 
he had a trial that started uh, January 31st, 2005, right? And we were still doing music up to that point. Now, for me, if, if I had down on my shoulders, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. so I'd be, I'd be paralyzed. How did you experience him deal with that? I don't know if he compartmentalized. I don't know how he did it. But we were working on music. So and did he work as usual? Or we, um, we worked through the beginning of December and then stopped working and then did this thing up at the ranch where the family was all there and he had a bunch of support. And then online, there's the Gerardo interview, right? Mm -hmm. And that's at my house. That took place at my house. So they all came over and that was like, I think early January of 2005. So we did the Geraldo interview there. And you'll you see me, you see Michael Prince, you yeah. see Geraldo, and you see Michael. That's in one of my studios. Um, I had two studios there. And um, then you see us in front of one of the mixing consoles. Um, I think Randy Jackson was there. He was me, Michael Prince, and Michael Jackson, right? And and then Geraldo, right? And so um, that, then three or four weeks later, the trial started, right? So he's most people when they're scared they get paralyzed right they can't do anything because they're they get depressed and and they they can't do anything he was still working on music that that's crazy and could you notice a change in the way he worked on it like he he uh not not really i mean obviously he was he was scared but he in other words imagine having something like that on your shoulders where you you can lose your freedom right basically so were we still able to work? Yeah. And, and, um, what was going on as far as how it affected work? I mean, the best stuff we ever did was at the end of 2004. So I don't, I don't really know how to answer that. We were doing the very best stuff we had ever done. So did you have a feeling that maybe he wanted to, um, focus on the music even more? Possibly, but I didn't see like some kind of, anxiety where you have to stay active all the time to not deal with mm -hmm. what's going on it was just kind of normal you know and I'm, I'm trying to think it wasn't there was less laughter but um it, it was musically it, the, the most creative stuff we had ever done was being done yeah so you know i, I don't know i don't know i mean we we just we work and um and then, you know, that whole beginning of 2005 was a trial and stuff like that. So, but at any rate, what a, I can't, I can't tell you, there's no way for me to like put my head on your shoulders and be able to see a hundred thousand people in front of you playing live or be in a room working on a song with them and how wonderful that is. I can't, there's no way I can, I can, I can talk about it, right? That's all I can do. But it's just, it was the most glorious 20 years imaginable. You know, it, it was, in retrospect, it's like, you know, boy, was I lucky. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's like, you know, you know, that show Breaking Bad mm -hmm. and, you know, Brian Cranston mm -hmm. and like it's a one in a lifetime role. The perfect actor for the, per you know, it'll never happen again. And that's the that's the same kind of chemistry this was. It'll this will never happen again. Working with the biggest artists in the world, being the closest person to him and doing music for 20 years with them and doing the tour. It's just inc incredibly wonderful. So if you were able to somehow send him a message today, is that what I you just, would I like just to say? I just say th th thanks for the most unbelievable 20 years ever. I say thank you, my God. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much awesome. for this yeah. conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. you for your time and thank you for all the work that you did. My pleasure. This is awesome. Yes. Yeah, you guys are great. For example, Strange in Moscow is one of my absolutely favorite Thank tracks. So yes, it's, it's amazing. So, mm. let me...